Hi team. So today's episode is with the wonderful founder and CEO of Taylor and Hart, Nikolai. He gives some unbelievable truths into what the journey is really like for an entrepreneur or a founder who's looking to create a multi-million pound business. That you don't appreciate is just how hard it's going to be being an entrepreneur. Honestly, I wasn't expecting him to be that open and honest. Um, just that was my preconception, but the insights he gave us have really made me think about the path those people leave and the, and the lives. Um, he likens it to a rock star at one point, and, and I think that is perfectly apt for what he describes. He also then gives some amazing insights into not just greenwashing, but what he thinks is the sustainability movement and what businesses really need to do in order to help the planet beyond getting certified. So I hope you find this one as interesting as I did. For now, over to Nikolai. It's a traditional story of having my own uh, adventure in getting engaged uh, and going through the options in the markets and feeling uh, quite stressed initially, quite disappointed at how um, how similar every option was and at, at the same time how uh, there was a complete opacity to the industry in terms of talking about provenance, uh, talking about price, talking about quality. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have a good friend in the diamond trade and I spoke to him about this and I said, look, there's definitely an opportunity here. You know, we're, our generation is going to start getting married. I'm thinking of getting engaged. Um, let's look into this. And, uh, we found that there were a few online companies who had taken, um, the, the first stage in disruption and they'd focused mostly on, around taking parts of the engagement ring in particular, the diamond and commoditizing it to make it much more accessible. There's no reason why a diamond with one jeweler that spends millions on branding and another jeweler that doesn't should be more expensive with the one that does the branding. Essentially, if they are exactly the same diamond, they should be the same price. So companies in the late 90s started uh, bringing diamonds online. What they failed to do is to understand that people don't think of an engagement ring like a commodity. And while the diamond uh, value aspect was a fantastic disruption because people could access diamonds at a far better price point. They didn't add um, the, the, the narrative, the storytelling, the emotion into their business models. And we saw that traditional jewelers still did a pretty good job at that, um, you know, trained and, and, and really good salespeople kind of add that layer of emotion when you visit the store. Um, but we, we, and we thought the opportunity was to take this online and uh, we, we felt that the, the key differentiation for our business was going to be in two areas. The one was the transparency. And transparency leads to being able to claim you're an ethical jeweler. It's not the other way around, right? You still First, you say, well, let's look at all the problems and talk about them openly. And it has taken us a long time to, to move into a space where we now even feel comfortable saying, actually, we're not just transparent. We are an ethical jewelry option. And the second one was around personalization and giving customers the ability for them to narrate the, the purchasing journey rather than us saying, well, this is these are the products we have. Uh, you have to choose one, which is the way the, the jewelry industry has worked for um, for a century, really. That's really fascinating. I think one of the things I noticed, particularly actually when listening to Steve Bartlett, is how many entrepreneurs find their business model based on a need based off something they need as a consumer that isn't currently being met in the market. And that's exactly what you've done here. You know, you've, you've gone to look for engagement rings and you've only found the, the existing market quite uh, challenging at that moment in time. And, it, and it's lovely that that's actually now your USP. I think, I think it's a fantastic model. Is there anything that you wish you'd have known when you first started the journey? I think the, uh, the main thing that you don't appreciate is just how hard it's going to be being an entrepreneur. It's so I think it's becoming uh, more talked about the, the mental health implications. And, uh, but at the time, I felt like the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial lifestyle, which is very intense and, 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 and to some extent not very healthy, was glamorized and um, it was like a rock star lifestyle. And I think you, in, you know, when you in your early twenties, you you have the energy um, to kind of just put the downsides aside. But in reality, it's just so much harder. And I think what makes it really hard in our space, in particular, 
is the fact that it's a very crowded space. Fashion and jewelry are probably two of the most fragmented markets uh, in retail. Uh, there is no single um, ma majority owner. Even the jewelry groups have 20, 30 brands that all look like they're very different uh, underneath them. And the, in, apart from the, just how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur and and um, and grow a company and have all the pressures from investors and customers and, and your own internal pressures, I think we found it really hard to build a differentiated brand. Um, we focused all of our energy on the customer experience. And in no way do I regret that. I think that was the right thing to do. And uh, without doing that, I don't think we would have reached our first million pounds in sales. Um, but what we really should have done after that is gone, okay, these early adopters who really kind of uh, aligned with our offering, um, we're, we're not going to be able to grow to a hundred million pound company uh, with the same customer persona. The next 99 million in turnover is going to come from people that have to understand what our brand is about. And we have to do a better job of communicating that. What we were seeing is that we had a fantastic new promoter score, customers coming to the end of the journey, being extremely excited uh, about the about the brand, but not really knowing how they became customers. We call them accidental by design. So we designed a great experience, but they still became, from their perspective, the accidental tailor and heart customers. They didn't come to us saying, I really like what you guys are doing. I've already understood it at kind of a top of funnel level, and I want a tailor and heart piece. And I know that it takes millions to build that kind of brand awareness, but there are tools now that can drop that cost. And I think we just didn't have a founder on the team that understood how to do that. Um, and in us being focused on the customer experience through service and technology, how do we just make the experience better? We we didn't address the brand differentiation and the brand messaging part uh, at the start. And, and I would say that this message isn't necessarily helpful to anyone who starts a business, but if you are starting a, bus a business in a crowded space, it's key. And um, we're now kind of at the last 18 months, um, we we are addressing this. We are spending a lot more time thinking about messaging, thinking about brand, thinking about differentiation, how to communicate our core values. So that's one 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 big thing uh, I wish I'd known. Um, and the other thing I, 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 I wish I had spent more time um, thinking about at the beginning was what it takes to build a venture funded business. Because I think building a business is different depending on whether it's a lifestyle business or uh, I know, a family business. A venture funded business has its own dynamics that are very unique. You have stakeholders that um, have a kind of expectation of growth and, and outcomes. And not that, that there's anything wrong with that, but if you don't understand the, the roller coaster you're getting on, you might find you're surprised and a little bit afraid when you're upside down at some point in the journey. Um, and, and what was helpful for us is doing the Techstars um, Accelerator. We did the uh, Accelerator in Boston in 2016. And in, in doing that, I think we were put in a group with other entrepreneurs, with mentors, who really helped us understand and align our expectations on what it meant to, to grow a venture funded business. So I wish that had happened at the beginning. A lot of companies that go into accelerators do that right at the start. We did that two years into our journey. Um, but for anyone who's thinking about building a, a, a massive company, uh, taking on venture funding, I, I think doing an accelerator like, like Techstars is, is a really good idea. It's really interesting. Is that how you, you know, started expanding internationally or was that just before that? It was kind of at the same time we chose to go to an accelerator in the U.S. to align with our ambition to um, to grow into the U.S. and it's now about twenty percent of our business and and we have a team there a showroom in New York. Um, the idea was let's let's learn about the market on the ground and at the same time let's try and kind of grow as a as a team um, and get the benefits that come with an accelerator around mentors, funding, um, uh, peers that can help you. So it was uh, it was a win win, um, both access to the market and and a, a kind of leap uh, in the company and the, the team's abilities. That's am that, that's amazing, um, and, and congratulations because I, I read recently that you're a team of fifty across five countries now. Um, yeah. So that that is you know in in the time frame we're talking about for for a market that's so crowded, you know you've got to be the fastest growing jewelers out there. Uh, maybe maybe in that category, maybe not the fastest. We'd love to grow faster, but um, um, yes, to the next two or three years, maybe we'll we'll claim that title. 
spoken like a true entrepreneur, never quite happy with where they've got to. They always want to get a little bit further. Um, you mentioned earlier that, that your product is such an uh, emotive purchase, and I think you're absolutely spot on with that. How do you manage to hold the customer's hand throughout the online experience? Because everyone's used to the retail experience where you can have that experience, you can have that salesperson there. Online, it's very different. And so many businesses struggle with transferring the culture of in-stores online. You know, how did you broach that? Uh, I think you use the word kind of hand-holding. And uh, I think holding a customer's hand is, is, is quite a tricky feat because you can hold it too early and push them away uh, or hold too late and they'll have gone elsewhere or made a poor purchasing decision. Um, and we we have this framework that we use from a, a, a business podcast that I, I really, um, the startup podcast it's called. Um, there, there was an episode on sales sales approach and there's a, there's a matrix that they talk about where on the one axis you have um, uh, aggressive or friendly and then on the other axis, you have weak or strong. And I think everyone knows the the, the category that lives in aggressive, strong. It's the, the person who is a hard sell. Um, you've almost bullied into buying. It's a kind of a persona that everyone knows from the movies and, and has personal experiences. Um, so I think we, un we understood that we absolutely did not want to be that persona. So instead, what we did is we went to the other end of the spectrum and we were what we call friendly weak. And Friendly Week is where you spend a lot of time listening and letting the customer drive the decision and just answer questions, right? Um, the problem with Friendly Week is that in a crowded space with a lot of aggressive strongs, sometimes you lose a customer because they just went into a store and were kind of bamboozled. We've, we've heard of these experiences. And in the podcast, they have a really good metaphor for how you move from, as a company, from friendly weak to friendly strong. And what does friendly strong really mean? And the way they explain it is, in the friendly aspect, you're listening first. And there comes a moment where every single salesperson knows if the customer they are speaking to is the absolute perfect customer for our business. Or in, in other words, to flip that around, if the tail and heart offering is the offering that they need and is perfectly suited to their needs, price points, uh, etc., and at that point, we say we turn on the heat, and that's when you basically the, the 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 strong part comes in, where we say to the consultants, you make it your life's mission to convince the customer, and it comes from a place of really understanding that this is the right product for them. So there's this kind of experience that you have where you are listened to first, and the listening to is sometimes the digital experience, the digital experience of clicking on things and selecting them, and us looking at the data and understanding and profiling this customer. And at the moment where we understand exactly what they want and the timeframes and the budget, and we, we know we know for what category of the market we really are the best tutor in the world. And that's usually around someone who wants quality but isn't prepared to pay a huge premium because of a brand and they want to personalize the design. They like to feel that it's that it comes from an ethical space. That combination of factors, we know that we've mastered those uh, that combination as, as the best tutor in the world. And at that point, the hand, that's when the hand holding really uh, becomes uh, uh, um, apparent. And we encourage customers to engage in an in-person or virtual or over the phone consultation where we really kind of educate them and, and um, make it a compelling argument for why they should choose us. But up until that point, you're not really sold to, if that makes sense. So that is, um, that is our friendly, strong uh, kind of paradigm that we use to uh, coach and select people to join the sales team. So we're looking for people that um, can exhibit high empathy, but also have a level of sales capability and flair. But we are careful about when they use it and how they use it. So we don't end up selling to people that don't, that don't end up feeling like that was the right decision for them. You you touched on um, the ethical challenges there around, I mean, the diamond industry as a whole. It's very well cited. Um, thank you, Leo, for Blood Diamond. It's a great film. How how did you work to overcome these or in, ensure that your business wasn't um, attached to the, the historic? I think Blood Diamond, basically, what it did is it created this tick boxing activity for every jeweler to say, well, we're ethical. And an organization called the Kimberley Process basically gave every single jeweler in the world a get out of jail free card, which is we're going to say on our website, um, we follow, uh, we purchase diamonds that have gone through the Kimberley process. Now, 
a Google search on the Kimberley process and nine out of 10 articles will tell you that it's flawed. So um, we initially went, right, we're, we're going to talk about the flaws and we're going to talk about what more can be done. And yet transparency and ethical sourcing still was considered in the business a hygiene factor. We didn't want to build a brand that was called the ethical jeweler. I know there are some out there that focus on this. We still felt like the main thing we built the business for was customer experience and storytelling and that ethical consideration should be a hygiene factor. We still think that that should be the case in any markets in the world. You shouldn't buy because it's ethical because what does that imply for every other brand that they're all unethical? So we should all be aspiring towards that. And we felt that that trend would happen and everybody would eventually have to do the right thing because the customers would demand it. So we didn't want to build a brand built on that. And in in a way, that was a mistake because um, a few things that we've learned since then, we've changed that approach, is that by using it as a hygiene factor, you don't do as much as you would do if you publicly commit to and publicly say, well, we're going to put ourselves out there and and commit to a roadmap. So we changed uh, our thinking uh, as opposed to uh, taking transparency and, and an ethical approach as something that was a, a trust tick box for customers. Like, okay, I've read about this. I feel good about it. I'm no longer worried. Now let me focus on why I'm really buying. We decided to make it a motivator um, for customers to consider us. Um, this year, we published our sustainability roadmap. It's basically the, the plan over the next three years in all aspects of the business, not just diamond sourcing. That's the other thing that kind of irritates me a little bit is that in the entire diamond industry, everyone just talks about diamond sourcing it with reference to Blood Diamond and, and obviously the Leo movie and what, what happened since then. But, you know, in every other industry, sustainability and ethics goes beyond that. It goes into work practices. It goes into materials used. It goes into behaviors, um, even taking positions on social on social points. So uh, our sustainability roadmap is now forefront to our, our kind of brand and market strategy. And it also created a, a, an inertia in the company to, to achieve those goals because we're now publicly committing to them. So I think that's really been helpful in accelerating our own sustainability goals, but also using it as a way to differentiate in the market, which I mentioned earlier is obviously so so tricky. Absolutely. I think we often talk on here about how sustainability is, is becoming more and more important, which rightly it should do. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, it goes so far beyond packaging. You're right. It goes within to all the workday practices. And that's what movements like B Corp and, and Can Advertising Network seem to be doing. Um, so it's fantastic that you've actually acknowledged that straight away and you're not trying to do small changes. You want to make a fundamental business sustainable approach rather than the small things just to start with um often they do look like token gestures and i think i think consumers are aware of that um, yeah i actually have a, a a view on that i mean i with no disrespect a lot of the companies that are b corp i i admire um but if you actually look at the opportunity cost of doing the um certification versus in the in the first instance doing just the work um, you spend a lot of time, and as a startup, um, you, you you may find that well, this year we could get the certification. And often, the certification comes with an audit and then a period of time to make corrections. So, in a three-year window, we could spend year one getting certified, but not having actually done anything, and then have two years to do the work. And when you don't know what you can do, that's the right way forward: get the audit, get people to uh, look into your company. And, but our roadmap is extensive and we really feel like we know what we need to do. The low-hanging fruits are really apparent to us. So we decided to go the other way around and actually not focus on essentially greenwashing our business with uh, logos and certifications and rather actually make meaningful changes. So, for example, our goals for this year, one of them is that our signature gem comes from the Greenland Ruby Company, which is a fantastic organization. Um, that is extracting rubies and, and pink sapphires in a very ethical way from Greenland. A lot of information about how they work and, and the practice, business practices they have. And then the second thing we're trying to do is move all of our gold to fair mined gold. Now, these are massive supply chain initiatives, and we would not have been able to do them if we went down the path of um, auditing and certification this year. We would have said, well, we'll do them as soon as we finish that piece of work. So we've decided to put the third-party um, audits 
second to the low hanging fruit. And I think you know, if a lot of companies look inwards, they'll see they'll know what the low hanging fruit is. If you don't know, then absolutely get help and identify. But I think when you're in a in an industry with materials like gemstones and gold, it's quite it's quite obvious and really apparent what what you can do in the first instance. So um, I think that that's the the better approach is first to identify your own roadmap and then once you've kind of ticked some of those uh, low hanging fruit boxes, look into getting external support for things that you don't know. I like that you've researched it enough to know and that um, some of your, one of your favorite brands, Patagonia is obviously part of it. So um, really, really entertaining that you've, you, you don't contradict it, but you have a, a different opinion on where to go. They're a much bigger organization, of course. And exactly. The large organizations, um, I think that they don't, they, they require a centralized process to uh, identify those low hanging fruits. I think in smaller companies, it's, you know, the founders are really close to this. They understand this. They can drive uh, the entire company just through vision and leadership. I think in a large organization, it requires. Um, so in, in, in all honesty, that's the, I would, I don't think that large companies should just mobilize internally because they could be missing a massive thing. But in, in smaller companies where the, also the opportunity cost and in investment into doing this uh, is probably going to be a bigger percentage of our total resource and budget in a, in a small company than it would be for, for a larger company. So they may be um, optimizing around low hanging fruits at the same time as doing the B Corp. So there they may not be an opportunity cost for them of doing one or the other. They may be doing both. But in our case, it definitely would be one or the other. Okay. Um, and you are an online business. However, you do have showrooms. So I appreciate you're, you're taking the model of bricks and mortar and e-commerce and, and trying to mix it together. Why did you choose to have showrooms instead of shops? Um, what, well, first to answer your question, why did we choose to have showrooms at all? I think as a, as a disruptive company, you think about what behaviors you may uh, change. And we initially were online only, and we decided that one of the behaviors we were not going to be easily successful in changing. I mean, with a lot of investment and innovation, possibly, but not easily was this feeling that customers had that they wanted to touch and, and see the product. Um, often, we found that it's not even about what they get from the showroom, but that customers felt that for the value of purchase, they should go into a store. There was like a, a feeling that this was how, the right way to shop because of the amounts I'm spending. I think that's changing. And I think the pandemic has helped with that. We've seen a huge number of customers happy with a virtual consultation. Um, so the reason why we started and where we are today, things have changed since then. Um, so we are actually more confident now that behaviors can change and people won't need the store. But that doesn't mean that they won't need a moment where they are ha where they have a consultation and we think virtual has a big role to play there and one of our ideas is actually about sending out your consultation kit at home while you do a virtual consultation so that you get the best of both you have the the moment where you've invested the time to make sure you're making the right decision you have elements of the, the physical product that are important for you to validate and learn and you have the service coming from the, the consultant so big things coming there from us in 2022. Um, but why store versus showroom? It's it's simple. I don't think that, that the benefit that customers get in a store versus a showroom is higher than the, the amount they're going to have to pay extra because of the rent of the store. Because essentially that cost is going to go somewhere and it's going to go to the customer. But I don't think that they're getting much more back from having a store, if anything. In some ways, I feel like stores can be less intimate, uh, more intimidating experiences whilst the showroom where you've kind of, you've opted in to go, you know, you're meeting someone, um, it can be a, a, a far more private and intimate experience. And, and COVID's actually not helped that, um, having gone down the high street, you know, the queues yeah. you've got to get in order to get into the jewellers to have that experience is, is quite challenging. So you're right, I like the idea of having an appointment and, and going in at that time. Um, why... So have you got two showrooms in London and you're a Manchester grad and you've got nothing up north? Very good question. And we do think about the markets up north all the time, to be honest. Um, the reason why we have two showrooms in London is many reasons, actually. Um, but the first reason was that we, um, as any startup, we do a lot of testing. And one of the things that we wanted to test was our ability to branch out from the head office showroom and have an autonomous showroom 
And we used we used it as a you know in all honesty as a as a case study for how we would open many more showrooms. Um, uh, we learned a lot from that. We definitely learned what not to do. Uh, often those are the best learnings. Um, and the thesis behind that was, and this was all pre pandemic, was with without having to split the team because they're all still the same resource. We could have two showrooms and have all the learnings without taking the big risk of having someone in another city where the the, the training, the interaction, the social elements of the culture of the company would be harder to find. So it was basically a baby step, plus the opportunity of being local to a different audience that we felt was working and shopping in, in around South Milton. Um, so there was a bunch of reasons. One of them was obviously just we needed more rooms and we could open more rooms in, in the current place, or we could learn a bunch of lessons around how to open a, a new showroom, um, how the team would work autonomously, and then we would go and roll out more throughout the UK and possibly some more in the US. Uh, and Manchester uh, was was definitely uh, a consideration there. At the t- this this all happened three months before the pandemic, and <laughs> our viewpoint now is let's let's wait before we have a larger real estate footprint, if, uh, because we we're not seeing customer behavior return quite to pre-pandemic levels. But um, yeah, Manchester, uh, keep an eye out. We're, we're definitely thinking about you. I hope that's that's nice to hear, actually, because I think a lot of business sometimes get stuck in the south. Um, and actually, Manchester, the, the whole Cheshire hub is, is a huge opportunity, a, a very affluent area where, you know, more people should be targeting. You, you don't need to sell it to us. We are with you 100 percent. There's also like a very big creative sector. And obviously, our customers are very much uh, um, in that persona. So uh, we we are totally on board with you. And we do target Manchester from a marketing perspective already in, in understanding that. So one of the things we do here is um, we ask our guest what question they would like to ask the next one. So our previous guest, Angela, wanted to ask the next guest, which happens to be you, Nick and I. So she's um, general manager of Rod & Gun, so a menswear brand. They are a Kiwi brand that has now come over to the UK. And she wondered what would you like or how would you increase your database size when entering a new market you know how would you how would you start to spread the word yeah it's it's a it's a good question um and it's i i guess it's not coming from us having done that well but we have a a thesis for how we're going to do that in the future we our, our current website experience is very much designed for people that are in that high level of intent like they are actively searching to buy an engagement room and that's how the that's how the experience is designed. But what we found is that sixty percent of our users are women, and ninety nine percent of our customers, the purchaser, are men. And then once again, ninety nine percent of our wearers or users are women again. So there's this interesting dynamic that happens in our business where you have obviously um, inspiration and and um, hinting happening from the partner to the buyer, and then the buyer hands over through a proposal back to the partner. Um, so what we're going to do in the, in the near future is we're, we're, we're going to have three different journeys on the website. And that first journey with an, ex, with an exchange of value, um, we're going to give customers this mood board inspiration experience, something that you would get from a personal bespoke jeweler, but use technology to deliver that. So what you're doing on the website is you are not necessarily going through a purchasing journey. You're going through a discovery uh, journey. And what you're getting at the other end is uh, what feels like a, a, an online bespoke experience. And we are dropping any kind of expectation on that being a sales funnel lead gen. So I think it's uh, our business, unlike many jewelers, is a, online jewelers, is, an, is a lead gen as opposed to an e-commerce business. 85% of our customers sign up on their first visit and then go through an online onboarding experience. But that onboarding experience you have to appreciate is not um, is a high intense experience. And actually most people aren't ready to tell you what metal style and shape they want. They don't know. Instead, what they'd like to know is what someone like them should like or could like uh, with an inspiration with an inspiration engine that makes recommendations. So to answer the question how we would do it and what we're about to do with our new website design is cater for the customers that aren't ready to buy, not just for the customers that are, because that might be a much longer funnel. Um, but those people are the people that, as I mentioned right at the beginning, that end up saying, I want to tailor and heart piece as opposed to being these accidental customers who just had a great uh, shopping experience. Um, 
and, and use tools, CRM tools, email automation tools to engage those people with meaningful, interesting uh, moments of delight that aren't pushing sales. Um, that's that's my approach, uh, and then wait for that to come back as a an increased brand awareness and brand desirability in, in metrics that only translates in six to twelve months. But you know you have to kind of take a long term position on this. What's really stood out from that that conversation and our whole conversation today actually is is how involved you are in the day to day in every decision that that comes up of the business. And you know this is a you're a multi-million pound business now. You're no longer that small startup, even though I'm sure you feel your culture is still there. What what does your average day look like? Are you involved in that day to day, or you know, are you a workaholic deep down? It's to be very honest with people listening or watching. Um, feedback I got from my peers is that I've been doing bet in December when we did our annual review. I, I asked for feedback back, and our CEO uh, kind of summarized. People said, Nikolai's doing better at letting go. He can still do more, but he's doing better. He's, <laughs> we can see he's trying. <laughs> um, so I'm very aware of this kind of founder moving into CEO of and moving into a CEO of a scale-up transition. And, 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 you know, I have no choice but to grow with it. Um, I would say that fortunately, um, because a year ago, my wife and I had twin girls, my priorities and the need for delegation and the need for uh, trusting people grew rapidly because even as a workaholic, unless you want to put work ahead of your children, um, which I definitely didn't want to do and haven't done, you have to just let go. So a typical day of mine is, um, is, is yes, being heavily involved, but we have really good people in the company from an execution perspective. So I'm an ideas person and for every, you know, 10 ideas, only one is really executed on. I think the, everyone in the company would go mad if I if I expected more than that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm heavily involved uh, in all aspects of the business, but at the same time, I've been pulling out quite a few. We have good people that we trust. And the reason why I can talk about them is because I'm just very curious to stay up to speed on what we're doing, but I'm not necessarily um, the driver in a lot of these great initiatives we have fantastic people who, who often come up with the ideas as well and, and execute on. on uh, I have to say, I already, I mean, congratulations on your twin girls, but I already feel sorry for their partners because, um, wow, daddy owns a diamond company, no pressure. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but yeah. <laughs> I, 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 They've I, got I, to get it right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe even the whole persona of being a diamond geezer, um, they might be intimidating in the first instance. I hope for that, actually, let's just say. <laughs> Last question, though. Um, I really appreciate um, your your honesty and actually the depth of some of the answers you've given. They're, they're, it, it's a great insight into a, a luxury emotive product like, like we've discussed. Excluding Taylor and Hart then and Patagonia, now I know they're your other favorite brand. Um, who is your favorite e-commerce brand at the moment? Um, and if you could ask the next person in the hot seat one question, what would it be? Yeah. Um, so a favorite e-commerce brand, I, as a, as a father, now that, you know, I am, I'm obviously shopping for children's products, uh, and mostly it's, it's a horrible space. You know, you're totally being uh, made to feel guilty if you don't buy the, the gadget with the most features. Thank God we got advice from people to kind of go low key that the old school gadgets are often the best. You don't need to have the wrist, uh, bracelet tracking heart rate and, perspiration and, and all of that um but in the in the space of uh e-commerce and children a company that we use and, and really love is called whirly um and what they do is they you, you sign it's a subscription service and they send you uh secondhand toys that you borrow and return and uh it's a it's what i love when sustainable brands also connect with an actual real human need so you're not actually feeling like, well, I'm going to do the ethical thing here. It's actually, no, that's what our children need. They get bored of toys so quickly. Um, so I don't want to be purchasing new toys and having to hold them in the house. I'd rather borrow toys. And as soon as they get bored, we send them back. So I think it's uh, a fantastic offering. I think more companies should be looking at building business models that are inherently addressing wastage or um, any kind of uh, social uh, ethical issue, but actually also serve the customer in the best way possible. So that's uh, props to to Whirly if they're listening. I'm really happy as a customer. I think everyone wants to know 
have we changed from the pandemic and in what ways, especially in e-commerce? Like, have we accelerated or um, some existing movements or have we actually initiated new ones? Because I think while you're in it, it's hard to see and everyone would like to know, have we as people changed and what are those implications on how we behave in terms of what we purchase and, and, and how we live? I think that's a great question. Uh, Google's cost per clicks have certainly gone up because the market suddenly becomes seriously competitive for absolutely yeah. everything. Um, yeah. So yeah, there are, from a tech provider perspective, we're definitely starting to see those changes and that those changes aren't declining. You know, those changes yeah. are in the long run. We've had but a few companies come to us since the pandemic and say, look, um, we had to go e-commerce during the pandemic because we couldn't have our bricks and mortar. But actually, now we don't want to change. Now we want to stay on e-commerce because it, it's a, a better margin for us. It's a better lifestyle for us. Yeah. Um, and inevitably, it, it's going to be driving prices up for everyone who's already there. Yeah. And even more reason to build a differentiated brand uh, because a PPC is, uh, is not the place to win as a growing company. Yeah, and actually, I think that's even more reason for people to um, try and test with uh, new media, you know, other forms of social media. We know that Facebook and Instagram's costs are through the roof at the moment. They're the highest they've ever been. But actually, TikTok isn't. Actually, Snapchat isn't. And and yeah. those are working really well for some brands. Yes, it's different. Yes, it's new. And it won't work for every brand because it's such a different audience. But it does really work for some people. Absolutely. I wish our target audience was on TikTok and Snapchat. Unfortunately, they're not just yet. <laughs> I think they're getting there, though, I have to say. Just through the fact that the generation is moving through and uh, people who are TikTok and Snapchat users will be getting married soon. But maybe it's still two or three years away where we start seeing more more of that persona coming but it is an interesting um piece and yeah anything we can do in order to, to help cut through um and and improve those marketing costs because that's one of the big questions that we ask ourselves all the time is what's the next marketing channel going to be you know yeah. youtube is fantastic it's very old now facebook instagram you know yes they've got the yeah. biggest user reach but they're still that they're, they're mature markets what yeah. is that yeah. next you know, Clubhouse didn't really take off. Um, no. I think that's dead in the water. Sorry if you're listening, guys. Um, so what is next, you know? And yeah. uh, it's a fascinating concept. Well, if, if I could venture an opinion on that, what we're excited about we is the digitalization of traditional brand building. Um, so you mentioned, it's not. A, I don't think it's about channels. I think it's about approach. So what I'm excited about personally is the fact that with YouTube, we can access people who've searched for engagement rings, but show them a traditional brand campaign, you know? So it's not about YouTube advertising. It's about high intent brand building. Uh, I can do that by using your data well. So I think it's about being smarter with the existing tools and creating kind of cross-platform campaigns that work well. Um, because traditional brand building, and we were even a part of that a few years ago, we did a big out of home campaign is kind of do a big spend, be smart about it, do your research, but you still kind of like don't know if it worked. Uh, and now that you can start tracking um, brand investment better, I think building brands digitally and not just spending huge amounts of money and hoping for the best, I, I see that as a, an opportunity that hasn't really been un unpacked fully yet. Well, wow. um, thank you ever so much for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. I can't imagine how busy your life is with two tin girls, a wife, and you know, a huge business to run in five different countries. Um, it's all part of the journey, enjoying it every moment. Mm -hmm.